America and other free and open societies face crucial challenges and opportunities abroad that affect security and prosperity at home. This is a series of conversations with guests who bring deep understanding of today's battlegrounds and creative ideas about how to compete, overcome challenges, capitalize on opportunities, and secure a better future. I am H.R. McMaster. This is Battlegrounds. On today's episode of Battlegrounds, our focus is on the history of Black American military service. Our guest is Dr. Kruoski Salter, a retired Army colonel, museum curator, military historian, and president of the Pritzker Military Museum and Library. Dr. Salter served 25 years in the U.S. Army. He is the author of Combat Multipliers, African American Soldiers in Four Wars, and the history of black military officers 1861 through 1948. Dr. Salter has curated multiple exhibitions, including permanent exhibitions at the Smithsonian, Museum of African American History and Culture, and the Pentagon. African American military members have played a key role in every American war. Approximately 5,000 black people, free and enslaved, fought for independence in the Revolutionary War. They fought for independence and the principles of freedom in the Declaration of Independence, especially the truth that all men are created equal and are endowed with the same unalienable rights. Their hopes for a government that would protect the natural rights of black Americans went unrealized as the Articles of Confederation sidestepped the issue of slavery altogether and the compromises necessary to ratify the Constitution in 1787 allowed that criminal institution to continue. It took the most destructive war in American history to resolve the greatest contradiction in the Constitution and free six million enslaved black people. During the Civil War, black soldiers made up about 10% of the Union Army. They were instrumental in securing the Union victory, ending slavery and granting full citizenship rights to black Americans. They fought valiantly, despite pervasive mistreatment and discrimination from within the army, and despite the risk that, if captured by Confederate soldiers, they faced torture or death. One year after the Civil War ended, Congress established all-black regiments, known as Buffalo Soldiers. Buffalo Soldiers fought in the Indian Wars, built roads across the American West, and helped deliver mail allowing information to flow throughout the growing nation. There were devastating setbacks on the long road to equality for black Americans, including the failure of Reconstruction, the rise of Jim Crow, the Ku Klux Klan, and the 1896 Supreme Court case Plessy v. Ferguson, which ruled that separate but equal, which really meant separate and unequal, was legally acceptable. Opportunities for black service members in the military diminished as prospects for equality dimmed. As W.E.B. Du Bois observed of this period, the slave went free, stood a brief moment in the sun, then moved back toward slavery. It would take a world war to revive the demand for black Americans to serve. In World War I, about 350,000 black Americans volunteered to fight for their nation mainly serving in segregated regiments. One of the most celebrated of these regiments was the Harlem Hellfighters. The Hellfighters, like many other black regiments, were assigned to fight as part of the French army because many white soldiers did not want to fight alongside them. Black soldiers in World War I were slurred, treated as subordinates, and segregated from their white countrymen. Veterans did not receive appropriate honor or recognition until decades after the war. While black soldiers fought and served abroad, at home, the war drove the first wave of the Great Migration from 1914 until the Great Depression. Hundreds of thousands of black people moved from the rural South to urban areas of the North. But post-World War I racism and social tensions increased in competitive labor and housing markets. Across much of the country, overcrowding, a shambling economy, white ethnic gangs unrestrained by police, and increased African-American resistance against racism, including veterans of the World War, 
led to racial strife and violence across much of the country. About 1.2 million African Americans served valiantly in the Second World War, fighting enemies whose empires were built on jingoistic theories of racial supremacy. But those American servicemen and women fought in segregated units, while their families endured racism and segregation at home. On June 26, 1948, President Harry S. Truman issued Executive Order 9981, abolishing discrimination on the basis of race, color, religion, or national origin in the United States Armed Forces. The last segregated units were disbanded in 1954. During and after the Korean and Vietnam Wars, an integrated military helped shape the civil rights movement. The atrocious nature of segregation became unarguable as soldiers stationed in the South who had fought for their nation abroad were denied access to whites-only establishments in towns outside military bases. The history of black military service in America's armed forces shows that progress toward equality of opportunity in our military was hard fought, but that progress demonstrated that equality, fairness, and opportunity make the military and our nation stronger. The U.S. military reflects inequalities in American society while also playing a vital role in dispelling the myths and eroding the racism that underpinned those inequalities. Americans should honor the memory of black servicemen and women who fought for double victory, that is, military victory abroad and race equality victory at home, through our determination to realize the vision of a nation in which all enjoy equal rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Black soldiers continue to serve with distinction in America's all-volunteer armed forces today. Because combat effectiveness depends on cohesion and teamwork, the military culture is and must remain fundamentally intolerant of racism or any form of prejudice or bigotry. We welcome Dr. Salter to discuss his scholarship on Black American military history and the implications of that history for the military and society today. Colonel Dr. Krawaski Salter, welcome to Battlegrounds. Hey, it's great to see you, my friend. After many, <laughs> many years when we taught together at West Point and we were we were neighbors uh, just a couple blocks away from each other, and you've done so much great work for our country uh, and and you know for in the army, uh, but also as a historian. And it's just great. It's great to have you on Battlegrounds. Okay, well, Lieutenant General retired H.R. McMaster, Ph.D., you know, just to give you all your accolades up front. And, uh, you know, before we go into the informality with the first names, uh, yes, I remember th those days. And the other day I was thinking uh, almost three decades. So we have to be careful about, you know, dating ourselves. But that was uh, a great time in the course. We crossed uh, each other several times on active duty. And like you mentioned, when I finally got around to making my dissertation into a book, um, I thought of you, I reached out to you, and immediately you responded and said, absolutely, I will write the forward to your book, so I appreciate it. Well, it was a, it was a great honor to do that, and, and I also remember just how great you were to me over the years by you know, visiting the, my commands. You, vis you came to Black History Month at Fort Benning, Georgia, you know, which is in many ways the heart and soul of the army soon to be renamed, which maybe we can talk about as well. And I think, I think yes. rightfully, rightfully so. And, uh, and gave a, a great talk to our, to our whole, our whole community there. And, right. and, you know, you've, you've given a great gift uh, to, Amer to Americans, uh, you know, we, in the intro, we, and, and we've covered this, our, our, our listeners, our viewers have just seen an overview of black military service based on your tremendous scholarship. And, and of course they, they will have learned from that, that black service members were in battles for our freedom, you know, from, uh, from the, the very beginning, uh, very beginning of our country, um, and, um, and 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 of course uh, they were not free from enslavement in, until 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 the Civil War. So I, I wondered if you could just begin with you know with, with a, a a professorial overview you know, of <laughs> of black military service, uh, you know, across all our all of our nation's wars and and what Americans should know about that experience. Absolutely. Well, you know, as a historian yourself. You know, when you give a historian the mic and you ask that type of question, you know, we could go on and on. You know, but first of all, you know, just like you, I was, uh, you know, one of the fortunate individuals who had the opportunity to teach at West Point. 
and to teach military history. So we go to school um, for at least two years to learn military history. And then we go to West Point and we have that full summer of indoctrination before we go into the class our first year. And so we're all military historians, but each one of us, you know, will branch out into something else that we want to try to make our area of expertise. And so obviously, you know, as an African-American, um, in addition to military history, when I went on to do my PhD, uh, my area was to focus on African-American history. So over the years, I decided to combine my two loves. I love military history and I love African-American history. And my major professor, uh, when he introduced me to that acronym ABD that you know, Albert Dissertation, he said, pick something that you understand that you will live with for the rest of your life. Pick a subject that you will live with and a subject you might be passionate about. And he planted a seed. And so I started studying the African-American military experience. And what I learned is that not only from the American Revolution, you know, some of us have heard of Crispus Attucks. Americans or people of African descent have participated in those wars. But in the American Revolution, and I'll try to give a brief overview and bring it from the American Revolution to the present to your, your question. But, you know, we always hear about Crispus Attucks and um, 1770, which is a full five years before the American Revolution starts. And that is really the first conflagration, you know, the first act of violence, if you will, because a lot of everything was pretty much on paper, you know, the Stamp Act and, and things of that nature. Uh, but among the first five to give their lives in an act five years was a person of African descent. And then we fast forward to the American Revolution, 1775 to 1783 you know, upwards to 6,000 African-Americans. And when I started this, you know, the number was 5,000, but scholarship and starting to dig it out. When I started studying this in the early 1990s, I don't think there were any African-Americans who were daughters or sons of the American Revolution. Now there are hundreds because that scholarship is starting to come out. And that was almost 20% of the American population almost 20% HR. And then of course, you know, we're, we're gonna fast forward through the quasi war, the impressment, um, you know, uh, incidents of uh, 1806, 1807, and just go to the, um, to the war of 1812. And again, Americans of African descent served in the war of 1812. And I'm gonna tie this all together in three clumps when I get to the American Civil War. And they were there in the three Seminole Wars, there were even African-Americans who participated in the Mexican-American War. When I started this, that wasn't well known, but a quote that I have and a lot of things that I do is a quote that a young Lieutenant wrote in 1845 to his uh, sweetheart. And he said, I have a black boy that I will take with me. He has been there before and I'm paraphrasing, and he speaks several languages. Lieutenant Ulysses S. Grant. He wrote that to his sweetheart, Julia Dent. And so I started you know, digging. And so there were some participations in the Mexican-American where you know, we, we were trying to find that primary source. Um, and then you get to the American Civil War and about 210,000, you know, 180,000 roughly in the USCTs and another, 30,000 in the Navy. Now we can take some stories, but I wanna stop there and have us understand that in that period from the American Revolution to the American Civil War, African-Americans were legally enslaved by the doctrine of our country. So they were fighting for freedom. So if I hearken back to the American Revolution, when you think about the Americans fighting for freedom against the crown, that's what we were fighting for as Americans, fighting for our independence, yet we were holding a people enslaved. And that's why when we go back to the American Revolution and you wonder why there were these people of African descent living on this continent who served with the British, because during all that time, people of African descent were fighting for the side that gave them 
the best chance of freedom, them, their family, and their society. And that's why you have African people of African descent who serve on the Seminole side in the three Seminole Wars between, <laughs> you know, the War of 1812 and before we get to uh, uh, the Mexican American War. And, you know, there is a uh, a quote that had always appeared the most iniquitous scheme to me, written in 1774, to fight our ourselves against a crown, and I'm paraphrasing again, for something that we are robbing of other people. And that was written by the wife of a future president and the mother of a future president. Abigail Adams wrote that in 1774. So there was a realization, even at that time, among people who weren't African, uh, of African descent, that there was some level of hypocrisy. And, and you've seen a lot of my writings. I uh, always refer to, you know, and there are white supporters, because we want to make, I always try to make sure that this is not a black and white, and it was always, you know, every African American is painted in this uh, picture and every white American is painted in this picture. And so now we brought it up to the Civil War. So now we have the three amendments and, you know, one of them is the 13th Amendment, which uh, frees African Americans. So now let's break it down in the second box that I normally try to tell the history. And we're going to go from 1865 to 1948, kind of with a crossover. So well, now- and just And just for viewers, just to, I mean, cross key, I mean, of course, that was the greatest contra contradiction, right, in our constitution. The Absolutely. greatest, you know, disappointment uh, in connection with you know with, with the the values and principles expressed in the Declaration, right? Especially that you know that that are created equal uh, and 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 have an equal equal right, equal opportunity to pursue right. you know, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So yeah. now we're up to the point where the war, in, in which I think uh, you know, well over two two hundred thousand uh, black soldiers served emancipated mm -hmm. whites and blacks on the north side emancipated right. six million of their fellow americans mm -hmm. and uh and so it took almost 100 years right to, yes. to expunge that you know that uh that that uh, contradiction uh mm -hmm. but of course as you're going to tell us <laughs> you know the struggle's not over yet and there were some setbacks along the way yeah absolutely and, and so that you know that's a good segue for uh my my middle section and so now african americans are not only uh uh, free people by the 13th Amendment, but three years later in 1868, now you have the 14th Amendment, so they're citizens. They're citizens. So, you know, you're, you're free before you're really, you know, considered a citizen. And then two years later, you have that other amendment, the 15th Amendment, which gave African-American men. Uh, remember, women uh, as Americans don't get the right to vote until the 19th Amendment in 1920. So theoretically, African-American men by constitution have the right before uh, vote before women of all races. But um, you're free, but you in the, you're in this period of reconstruction where we believe we're coming out of, the, out of this period of, of slavery. Equality is going to be granted to us. America is going to move forward. And of course, Reconstruction is the country needed to reconstruct itself after such a war. But then we have the compromise of uh, 1877, uh, 1876, which put Rutherford B. Hayes in the office. It took occupied troops out of the South and that left those newly freed African-Americans to the perils of what began to happen. Uh, Jim Crowism, um, extreme segregation, and then separate but equal when you get to the Plessy versus Ferguson. And it, it's a horrific uh, period for African-Americans um, and for some of their white supporters. And, you know, we can go into some detail uh, on another show. Uh, well, you you've, know, got, you've got the rise of the Ku Klux Klan. You have really a, the rise of a terrorist organization, right, that is pursuing a political objective yes. by, by, by committing violence against innocent people. That's the definition of terrorism, and that's what they were yes. doing, where, yes. where, was to deny uh, black uh, Americans, their citizenship that had been granted uh, after the Civil War. Yes, yeah, so I have a book on my, on my shelf here that I read in graduate school, and you probably have it. And I went back to it. It's called White Terror. Yeah. And it was about that period. It was about that period 
from 1866, the rise of the Ku Klux Klan and other terrorist te uh, terror groups, which were going around terrorizing African Americans to deny them the right to vote, to deny them citizenship, to deny them those three amendments. But you know, to add some insult to injury, now it gets codified. You know, we have the uh, civil rights uh, case of 1883, I believe it was, which now codified in law that African Americans could be segregated and not use uh, hotels, that white Americans could use transportation and restaurants. And then fast forward to 1886, now you have Plessy versus Ferguson. And that's the first, you know, a light-skinned African-American in uh, Louisiana who petitioned because, you know, he should be able to ride anywhere on the train that he chooses to ride, but he was denied that privilege. Uh, that case was lost. And that's the first bookend of Separate But Equal, which lasts until 1954 with the Brown versus the Board of Education. And, 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 which, which, which we, and which we all know is really separate but unequal, right? Separate but unequal, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Um, but getting back to military history, African Americans were still serving. So in addition to those three amendments, we have uh, um, the Army Reorganization Act of 1866, which now African Americans can be a permanent part of the military. Yeah. And so uh, in the Reorganization Act, there were six uh, units named. They ended up becoming four, the 24th and the 25th Infantry Regiment and the 9th and 10th Cavalry uh, Regiment, uh, yeah, Cavalry Regiment. And they served on the Western frontier. And one of the things, we can tell a lot of stories, but one of the things I try to get across to people is, you know, there were 25, it's easy for us to remember how many infantry regiments. There were 25 because the last two were named for the African-American units, the 24th and the 25th. And it's easy to remember how many cavalry regiments there were. There were 10 because the last two, the 9th and 10th were named for the African-American units. But when you think about it for those mathematicians, 20%, 20% of the cavalry soldiers in the army were African-American HR. Yeah. Right. And so while all this is going on, they're still serving heroically uh, on the Western frontier. And, and, you, and you know, uh, Karofsky, they, they, uh, you know, they, they served with great distinction on the Western frontier, but also they taught uh, the equestrian courses at West Point as well. Yep. West Point, uh, Fort Myers, uh, Fort Leavenworth, um, and a few others. I mean, eventually, and then they were also a part of the first park rangers before the park ranger yeah. system started in 1916. You know, there was a rotation and, you know, the third African-American to graduate from West Point, Charles Young, uh, you know, served out in, in the parks in the 18, uh, 1890s. And they're also and still- I hope, I hope we talk more about him too, right? Because, I mean, he raised, yeah, he, he went to, he became a colonel and was yes. and, and was desperately trying to serve in World War I and was denied the opportunity. So I think you're about to tell us <laughs> about yeah. how World War I shapes experience. And this is, I, I've just got to tell you, this is the best seminar I've ever heard on it because what you're doing is you're interweaving what's happening in American society with what's happening in, 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 the, in the American military uh, mm -hmm. in connection with you know the Black American experience and really U.S. history. So keep going. <laughs> Okay, so we'll jump forward because I know we only have so much time. So let's jump to World War One, and we can talk about you know the uh, SOS troops and the uh, the two infantry regiments. But you know, let's talk about Charles Young and also put it in the context of West Point. We said he was the third African American, so that means there were two others before him. There was John Hanks Alexander. Where Charles Young graduates in 1889, Alexander graduates in um, 1887, and Henry O. Flipper graduates in in 1877. But Charles Young is the only one that had a full career. You know, Flipper was uh, drummed out of service. Uh, Alexander died on active duty while he was the professor of military science and tactics at Wilberforce. But Charles Young, who graduates in 1889, dies on active duty in 1922. But so he's a, a lieutenant colonel when the war started, had had a, a full career, but he had been placed on the 06 list. 
He had passed the test. He had passed the physical. And 06 is Colonel for our viewers. Colonel, that's right. And 06, uh, you know, Lieutenant Colonel <laughs> 05, uh, 06 is a Colonel, the rank right below General, which comes key to our story. And so uh, um, when there were some letter writing campaigns by a few young lieutenants who ended up being under Charles Young, which in that day, you know, there was an unwritten rule that African-Americans would not be over white officers, but Charles Young ended up being over white officers, young officers a few times for short periods. Uh, you know, he was eventually uh, forced to um, not retire, but he was taken off the active duty rolls. He was sent back to Letterman Hospital for another physical. And, uh, you know, he did have high blood pressure and Bright's disease, but, um, the physician deemed him duly able to serve. Well, you, you tell the story too in your first book about how he rode on horseback. I mean, for almost like 500 miles from Ohio to Washington, D.C. for his physical just to say, hey, listen, you know, I'm yeah. ready to go. After he took the physical, so he wanted to prove that. And so he rode and I, I've done that route now, H.R. You know, when you get out of the Army and you start do some research and, you know, yeah a mall here, a grocery store there. And I did their, his route also in California. Um, and so he, he, he wanted to prove his uh, physical prowess, but nonetheless, um, you know, he, um, you know, was left into uh, the medical roles. And he actually wrote a letter to John J. Pershing. And actually, you know, Pershing had been one of the instructors while Charles Young was at West Point. And there had been a relationship. Um, but the interesting thing is, of course, he never got to serve. He petitioned, he wanted to go overseas. He wanted to hopefully be a commander, one of those two divisions, uh, the 92nd or the 93rd, or maybe just one of the brigades and get that start. And that is uh, probably the crux of the matter. If he would have been put in one of those positions, he was already going to be a colonel. He would have been promoted to one star. And of course, we're still researching. There's going to be a book coming out. I know the book. Uh, I know the gentleman writing it, and I know he's doing some research uh, on this, and we'll get more. You know, so there, there, there's still both sides of, of, of the story. But the interesting thing, HR, is he was brought back on active duty on November the 5th, 1918 just six days before the war ended. And then he was sent back overseas. Um, I think it went, he went to Liberia back as a uh, attache yeah. and that's where he died on active duty. And so a lot of people look at this, well, if he was not healthy enough hmm. to serve and go to France in 1917, why is he now all of a sudden healthy enough to go back to one of those, what we call um, assignments for black officers. Because unfortunately, uh, uh, some of the uh, uh, African countries is where the black officers were being rotated back through or going back to be professor of military sciences at the HBCUs, historically black colleges. Mm -hmm. You know, so, you know, that that's one of the stories that I, many stories, you know, just like you, you know, you live in these men's uh, shoes, their boots, their uniform when you're when when you're studying them to write it. And I've always tried to be as objective as possible to get the story across. But I do believe that Charles Young was wrong. That's just my personal opinion. Uh, I do. You know, believe so that's what I love about your book is for each of these eras, you know, you are, are you know, for all for uh, both your books. And then and then also the essay that you wrote on World War One, which we're coming up on here in terms of the chronology and 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 uh, you know the black military experience and how that interrelates with what's happening in society is you 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 introduce the broad themes right and and what readers should understand but then you give these really compelling personal anecdotes you know that that I think help you connect with the black military experience in a way that you wouldn't otherwise. Yeah, and I, I I've been criticized by some by not making conclusions, but I did make one conclusion here that I do feel Charles Young was wrong. Um, but I do try to put what I have found as the facts in front of people. And also as a military historian, anytime I write about an African-American history piece, I always put it in the entire context. So, you know, anytime I'm writing about the American Civil War, I try to set up the different, you know, 
uh, theaters of war and what's going on in that theater of war and how this battle that the African-American soldiers may be participating in contributes to that strategic victory. Right. Um, or, right. you know, even if it was a loss. Um, you know, and and that, this is what this is what you do is, and this is what you're doing for us now, is you place Black military experience and the African-American experience more broadly in context of the overall American experience. And I think there are those today who want to kind of wall it off, you know, and yeah. and I think you lose the richness of the history and Thank and you. and prevent us from really fully understanding the travails and difficulties, but also celebrating the great triumphs and, and the great contributions uh, to our nation overall. Yeah. And, and so to that point, I guess I would say one thing, because you know, I used to teach African-American history too. And the first thing I would do, you know, people come into your classroom and you have African-American 101, 302. The first thing I would do is erase African. Right. And I would say, this is an American history class. We are just going to do it through the African-American experience. And that was cool because when I got to work at the Smithsonian, yeah. uh, the mission at the National Museum of African-American History and Culture is not African-American history. Is we are telling an American story through the African-American lens. So that's number one. And also I point out in my book, you know, you know, there are leadership lessons, you know, and when you say, well, the African-American soldier can't fight, he can't lead, he can't do X, Y, and Z, mm -hmm. I, you know, just like you, there are about five or six books I want to write. One of the books that's in my mind is like leadership, you know, and so I always try to I always say they're they're white supporters and show that it's not necessarily a black and white. So give one vignette when you talk about World War One is William Hayward, who was the uh, commander of the 369th. Um, and there are other white commanders of some African-American units throughout history. When those commanders treat their soldiers as men, they respect their soldiers, they go forth and they fight well. And if we get to the day and we talk about that trust and that cohesion breaking down, yeah. when there's a commander leading you and you know he or she, you know, doesn't, you know, really value you and don't trust you. And I write about a few of them in, in my book. Um, then those units don't do well. It is a proven fact that leadership matters. Absolutely. And whenever you, whenever you see whatever military unit, if you ever see or hear a commander complain about his or her soldiers, that's just, that's just, you know, it should be a big you know, sign that, Hey, the problem's actually with that leader. Yeah. 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 And I always say, you know, my success in the military uh, was because not because if someone thought I was a great leader, it's because that I had great soldiers, but I had great NCOs. You know, the backbone and, you know, for me, I was raised by an NCO and that's why as coming up through the ranks, uh, I knew when I was a second lieutenant that my E7 first sergeant outranked me, although he <laughs> said, sir, and I knew that when I was a uh, captain battery commander, my E8 first sergeant, he outranked me, although he said, sir, and, you know, that, that's the way I approached things uh, yeah. as I was going through the military. Um you know, because Krosky, I don't know if you know, my, my dad was a first sergeant in, in infantry in, in the reserves, and then he got a direct commission later. So I know I can wow. totally connect with that as well. And, I, you know, I often say the most beautiful word in the English language is sergeant. And then I think, <laughs> and when you see kind of the strength of our military relative to others, I think the strength of our non-commissioned officer corps, and I would say junior leaders in general, including our yes, yeah. lieutenants and captains, uh, yeah. is what differentiates us. Yes, Exactly. And of course, you know, you know, when you have a good soldier and a bad soldier and uh, you depend on your NCOs, you know, to, to help you out. How are we going to deal with this with this soldier? Can we train this soldier or is he or she not good for the cohesion of the unit? Uh, because we, we might have to go forth and do something. Right. Um, so I may have lost a train of thought on what. So we're going to World War One. So we've talked yeah. about we've talked about, you know, the the Buffalo soldiers, the 24th and 25th regiments on the frontier and now you know the effect that world war has in the midst of you know the jim crowism and all the problems here in in our in in our society uh we're confronting a world war and and again Afri african americans black americans are mobilized for war yeah mobilized and not only mobilized i mean they mobilize themselves 
they were Americans. Yep. So most African Americans supported the war. And I say most because, you know, we have to also understand that African Americans were never monolithic. You know, so a lot of us know W.E.B. Du Bois, who said, you know, close ranks, something to the effect of close ranks, put our separate grievances aside and let's fight this war while the war lasts. But then you have folks like A. Philip Randolph, who is also key and important for the progress of African-American history, who was this young 28 year old male in 1917, who took on the sitting president when President Woodrow Wilson on April 2nd, I believe it was in 1917 in the declaration says something to the effect in the long speech of make the world safe for democracy. A. Philip Randolph in his, in his uh, periodical, they wrote, um, we would rather make Georgia safe for the Negro. And Georgia was a metaphor for America and safe for the Negro was a metaphor for all of the lynchings that were that, that was still happening. I don't know if you looked at you know some of the stuff that uh, we were able to do in the World War One exhibition with the flag. A man was lynched yesterday. Yeah, that was made after the war because lynchings were still going on even post World War II. Mm -hmm. So you know there were some folks who you know followed the A. Philip Randolph and rightfully so. Uh, but most African Americans did close rank and they went forth and fought and to the tune of 400,000 African American men, which is exactly 10%. This is an easy number to remember for World War II as well, because you always know that 4 million Americans were mobilized, 400,000 African Americans and 200,000 of those American soldiers, uh, 2 million of those American soldiers went overseas and almost 200,000 African-Americans went overseas. So think about it, 10%. Um, and I'm not really gonna talk about the combat armed soldiers unless we have time. I wanna talk about the SOS, Services of Supply, because almost 40% of the soldiers that made the fighting force um, load and unload and go forth and fight the Americans or African Americans. If you look at the maps and you look at the history, and it's just like when we get to World War II, uh, you as an armor officer, me as an air, air defender, you know, we can't go forth and do our combat arms job without that tell. You know, when one pilot goes into the air in the Air Force, I don't know the number, but there's about 10 to 15 airmen on the ground that yeah. makes sure that that one pilot gets in the air for his his aircraft. You know, I'm just guessing on the number. I do know it's a lot. So I don't want my Air Force friends to say, oh, you screwed that one up. Um, but, but you know what I'm getting at. And that is what happened in World War I. And so we'll talk about that when we kind of get to present day, when we talk about you know national security, because I do think there's a national security uh, tie as we spoke about before. Um, but you do have, those African-Americans who go into the trenches, uh, such as the 369th, but I'm not gonna talk about them in the context that we all know and, and the great things that they did do. But what I wanna say is they were one of eight infantry regiments. They weren't the only infantry regiment, they're just the most famous. You know, there was the 92nd division that had the 365, six, seven and eight, Regiments which fought, which fought uh, with the French. The right? American, no, the 92nd oh, Americans. fought with the Americans. So okay. the 365, 366, 367th, and 368th. Then there was the 93rd Division, right? Which was the 369, 370, 371st, and 372nd, and they fought under the French. Mm -hmm. That's another one of the stories on leadership. Those four regiments that fought under the French, because the French were were so happy to get soldiers. American soldiers, they treated them as equal to the point where there was actually a letter that was sent to the French to be careful of how you treat. Yeah, and don't and and don't praise them too much, right? Yeah, because because the the your fellow the American officers on the other side, you know, uh, you know, Pershing's headquarters and stuff might, uh, you know, might be might, that might not be something they want to hear. Yeah, and so in the 90, 92nd division, um, uh, that did not happen. Um, but we talk, and so in the, in the leadership thing, so that I'm thinking about, 
So let's do talk about that when we think about the 369th. The other thing is their officers were white American officers, but as I said, you know, uh, William Hayward, and then there was a young captain named Hamilton Fish. I can't remember the second or the third or the fourth because there is still a Hamilton Fish that's the fifth or sixth. Um, but um, the Hamilton Fish that was a captain in the 369th, they treated their soldiers fairly. They praised their soldiers. And if it were not for Colonel Hayward, the 369th and some of the other African-American units would have been SOS because that's what they were doing for the first two months. Hayward went to Pershing's headquarters himself. And he said, these men have trained as infantrymen. I didn't come over here. And he said a few, you know, things, you know, the big bitches and, you know, the X, Y, and Z. We came over here to fight. And they did well. And so it was not only the French that, that treated them well, that happened, but in those units, by and large, because they were National Guard units, and that's the difference, HR as well. You know, the 92nd, uh, that those soldiers were mostly made up of draftees and most of the officers, because there was a belief that Southerners knew how to handle African-Americans, um, those were most, most of the officers in those units. Now, the 92nd Division, most of those officers and soldiers were National Guard units. So I'm sitting here in Chicago now, and you know, when I say it's because the 369th was the most famous, the 370th, the Black Devils. I mean, they went the furthest uh, of any uh, African-American unit and a lot of American units at the end of the war because of the unit they were attached to. And then because of the unit the 369th was attached to, they were among the first Americans to get to the Rhine, not cross the Rhine. They reached the Rhine with their Rhine River um, with their unit. You know, so leadership matters. Um, and I won't belabor the point, but um, if you look at the numbers and look at what these soldiers did, were they combat multipliers? That's why I named my book Combat Multipliers. You make the determination. But when you think about 40%, um, and the last point I want to make if I have time is, uh, you know, one of the reasons in, in the context of history, we know that the Germans kind of made two mistakes that kind of pissed off the Americans. The Zimmerman letter and going back now to unrestricted submarine warfare, you know, um, you know, uh, you know, we may talk about that later if you want to interject on that. Um, and the reason they felt they could do that because they did not think that the Americans could power project many things they didn't think. But one of the reasons as, as I was doing some digging is they did not think the Americans could power project themselves to Europe. Remember, World War I, we do power projection in our sleep now. It's going on right now as we talk. But in World War I, um, the only power projection that we actually had in our history, it was two. It was the Spanish-American War, but that was a little jump to Cuba. And then you could say the Mexican-American War of 1846 to 1848, but that was power projection across a border you know, from Texas to Mexico. We had to go across the ocean and tie it back to African-Americans. African-Americans were 40% of that labor force, HR, that helped the U.S. get there. And so you make your own conclusion. And we'll tie that to today, why you need every man and woman in your continental United States and American to be a part of your fighting force, Absolutely. Um, yeah. Absolutely. So, Ski, we talk. I know it's hard to fast forward through all these periods of time, yeah. but of course, you know uh, the the uh, the you know the third graduate from from West Point, uh, yeah. who I think entered service in eighteen ninety three. Or maybe that was from the last graduate. Was it? Well, third graduate, graduate that, that, that was Charles Young. Are you Charles talking about Young, eighteen ninety three? Yeah. No other graduate till 1936, right? Which puts us yes. kind of on the on the eve of World War II. And of course, what's happening in this period of time is, is, is I think we have to talk about the return of World War I soldiers and how Jim Crow was intensified in that period of time as a way almost to preempt those who had served overseas from demanding uh, their, their, their civil rights and how there was an accommodation in this period of time between North and South 
Yes. But it was an accommodation between Northern whites and Southern whites. And this is when so many of the posts that people are probably wondering why we, we should be renaming them. Those posts were named for Confederate leaders, really tra traitors from I was T-R-A-I-T-E-R-S from mm -hmm. the, the Union uh, for slavery. And and so I think it's, it's fitting to rename them. That's just my personal uh, opinion mm -hmm. based on that history of why they were named uh, right. and when, when they were named and for what purpose. But uh, you know, of course, there 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 are disappointments now uh, among Black Americans who come back from World War One. You curated a tremendous, you know, a, 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 you know, a, a, a tremendous, uh, um, gosh, display and and explanatory explanation of this in uh, in in the museum in the Smithsonian. Could you ex could you explain kind of that really quickly, and then and then maybe we can get to the end of your book on Black officers and and, and talk about World War Two a little bit. Okay, so so now there, so, so there, there are four questions there. So one, uh, the the time frame between 1889 and 1936. Why, with Benjamin O. Davis, the treatment of African Americans coming back from World War One, and then the renaming of a uh, uh, post and the epilogue post World War Two. So let's look at that period. And I'll, I'll make these, these as short as possible. You know, and this confused me early on. Why did it take so long for another African-American to graduate from West Point. That is how successful Jim Crow, separate but equal, and the failure of Reconstruction was. Um, because in my book, I talk about all 27. 27 African-Americans were appointed to West Point, 12 were admitted, and only three graduated, which was on par with the attrition rate. And that's the reason it took so long. Um, no one was appointing and advocating for African-American equality to go to the nation's military academy. That's a simple answer, and there's a lot to it. And this is the period when, when lynchings were happening. So that's um, that. And so in the middle of that period is the return from World War I. African-Americans had closed ranks like uh, a W.E.B. Du Bois asked them to do. And when they came back, there was this period of red summer. And red summer was a period where over 40 race riots and massacres, you know, some, they used to be called riots. We have already, we've done the study where some were actually, they were massacres. A riot is when, you know, people are kind of going at each other. A massacre is when you are just being pounced upon. And there were 40 uh, riots and massacres uh, after World War I to do what? to put the African-American back in his and uh, her place because now they were filling their contributions to the victory of the war. Some of them had been treated fairly by the French. And among some of those folks who were lynched were soldiers. And I'll tell this one story. This is, uh, and I didn't come across this story until about 10 or 15 years ago, digging a little bit more and, and doing some research also for the Smithsonian is, um, and his name is escaping me. I wish I went back and looked at this, but nonetheless- We, are getting, we are getting older, <laughs> we're getting older, man. <laughs> but it was the Elaine Massacre, I am. It was the Elaine <laughs> Massacre in, se in September of 1919. There was this young man out with three of his brothers hunting. And when they came back, they were attacked by a white mob. And there's the implication with uh, equality for work and pay and X, Y, and Z. But this young man was in the 369th. He had survived the trenches in Europe, HR. And then he came back only to be killed in his uh, own country. And so that's the return that African-Americans uh, return to. And so them, and, and there are white supporters. I always like to point out this too, you know, people when they say, well, there was a question in a program to a, a, a gentleman we had and someone asked, and I was controlling the chat as the moderator, well, were, were there any white organizations that were supporting and speaking out? I'm just gonna say the NAACP. And people say, well, that's an all black <laughs> you know, organization. NAACP, 90% of the founders of NAACP when it was established in 1919 and what they were doing in the early years were white Americans. You know, so again, it's, and so during the Red Summer, 
uh, not only were white uh, African Americans fighting a back, you know, they, they did have their supporters. And so that's one question. I think the other question uh, you were asking is about the naming of the forts. You know, most of these forts were named in that period. Uh, actually, the law, I'm going to throw this other term in there, the lost cause. You know, we talk yeah. about suffer but equal and we talk about rise of Jim. The Crow. myth of the lost cause, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And so the lost cause is, you know, hmm. the, uh, the side that really lost the war, the South, ended up winning, winning the social, cultural, and political norms of the time to where forts were named and they still exist um, af after, you know, soldiers who fought for the Confederacy to what you said. And so now there has been a push um, of renaming some of those uh, forts. And I'm like you, I think some of those forts certainly uh, should be renamed. You know, I also, I'm here at the Pritzker Military Museum and Library, I had to put that plug in, you know, hopefully that's okay. Um, and, you know, you know, check us out. But, you know, I started my museum leadership career after being, you know, with the Smithsonian at the First Division Museum. Yeah. And so when you, when, when you uh, study uh, the First Division Museum, you learn, I had to be the expert in the First Division story. You know, the first Mexican-American four-star general was Richard Cavasso from Texas. So he's one of the names put in for Fort Hood. Yeah. You know, so right. to your point, you know, it's not just naming the force after African Americans, it's naming the force after other people who have been in our now integrated force. So I say that to say this, I agree with you, and I I'm a part of that push if they rename Fort Hood for General Cavazos. I think mm -hmm. that's perfect. He's a son of uh Texas, first yeah. Mexican American to achieve four star, and he did great things for our yeah, our force. Right. You know, he, he gave the most inspirational speech I heard when I was a kid at West Point, too. And so, you know, you forget most of those. I remember his. I mean, there, there wasn't a dry eye in the, in the auditorium when he yeah. was finished. Yeah, yeah, it's amazing. You know, you, you guys who are general officers, when you get up, you know, I'm always in, in, inspired. I mean, you, you're right. I, I've heard great speeches and uh, I've heard a few. I, I missed the military, but I, I don't want to go back. When I decided to retire, I was ready. But I've been places and I was like, man, I want to join again. You know, so, uh, um, and I think your last question, the epilogue to my book, and that'll bring us to maybe some present day, you know, and so, and my book on black officers, you know, so just a distinction, you know, three national level, national level exhibitions, uh, two books and a host of, uh, you know, articles and, and vignettes. So we're going to talk about the black officer in the epilogue. And so that book was solely about the rise and the struggle of black officers from 1861 to 1948. And that's the bookend of the start of the American Civil War and Executive Order 9981. You know, that's the bookend. That's Truman's the, integration of the of the of the military. Of the military. Yeah. And so what I just say in the epilogue, because that was my dissertation finished in 1996. But unlike you who dusted yours off and it became a book dereliction of duty, you know, a few years after, I put mine on the shelf. And I didn't dust it off until I retired. So it was published in 19, in 2013. So I was able to bring it forward. And I've been studying every year now as I do the uh, Army de demographic reports. And so what I say in the epilogue is the military of all the ills that African-Americans experience up to World War II, and they were still experiencing some of those, um, because Pre uh, President Truman had the courage to stand up and do what President Wilson didn't do in 1919, talk about leadership. Uh, President Wilson was completely silent on the Red Summer. When it got to President Truman in 1946 that African-Americans were being beaten and some killed in 1946, He's a veteran himself. He was an artilleryman in World War One. I've been on the exact ground where he, um, you know, where he served. He was an um, artillery battery commander, I believe. Yes, right? he was an artillery yeah. battery commander, and like I said, been there. Uh, you know, he was outraged. Commissioned a study um, to secure these rights, and one of the things that came out of it was Executive Order Nine Nine Eight One that you defined. And so the military was ahead of the curve. 
That didn't mean that African Americans who served and especially officers in 1950 and 19, in the 1960s had complete equality in society, but I could give several examples. I don't know if you want me to give one, either Powell or, or Beckton. Um, sure, yeah, hey, I, absolutely. And for our viewers, tune into a previous episode on General Roscoe Robinson as well, who began his military career around this time and yeah. became the first four-star uh, Black American general. But please, Ski, give us a, give us an example. But I will say the first four-star army because, army, army, yeah, that's right. Because uh, General uh, Chappie James, who was an Air Force, the Air Force gets the credit for having the first four-star general. Right. It was Chappie James. Um, but you know, just a couple examples. All of these officers will tell you that now, when they were stationed in the South and when they were on post, it was utopia for them because it was equality. But when they went outside the gate. You know, it was like an enclave, a post was an enclave of equality in the 50s and the 60s for these Black officers and soldiers. Yeah. But when they went out into the community, they couldn't go to certain restaurants. Yeah. Uh, they couldn't go to certain hotels. And so this was still happening. Um, and then we get to the all-volunteer force in 1993. And I'm fast-forwarding, you know, I hope I'm not skipping. Yeah, 1970, 73, right? 73. 73. Or, and yeah. so, you know, now the door begins to open um, for a little bit more equality. Um, but the playing field is not really even uh, for a lot of folks. And there was an African-American who was selected as the first uh, African-American secretary of the army, Clifford Alexander. Um, you know, he got a report of the general officer list, you know, as we know, and I'm, I'm sure you sat on several boards. I had the opportunity to sit on two boards in my career in the military. When the general officer list came to him, I think it was in 1978 or 79, there was zero, zero. African American officers on the list. And he couldn't believe it. He sent the list back and he said, I cannot believe. And so we're we're in high school at this time, you know, yeah. so this is our right. lifetime. I can't believe that there are no African Americans qualified to be general officer. And this goes to some of the biases that still exist today in some arenas and institution biases. And of course, uh, two of the benefit uh, uh, beneficiaries of that was uh was uh, Hazel Johnson, the first African-American woman to be promoted to general officer, and Colin Powell was on that list, you know? Um, and then from there, we begin to have some barriers breaking down. Um, and so I talk about that in my epilogue. And then I also talk about the fact that, um, you know, this duality, uh, you know, kind of what W.E.B. Du Bois said, double consciousness and the two-ness of African-Americans. We are in our black skin, but we are, we are Americans and we just want to move forward just like everyone else have that equal uh, playing field. And, and there's still a perception on both sides. There's a uh, perception and a reality, you know, among um, some folks that they are not being promoted um, because someone in their rating chain may have had a bias to them and that rating affected them along the way. And that's why I have, I did go back and read my epilogue the other day. And that's why I have all italicized, all OERs, because the higher you get up and the weeding out begins, all of your OERs become important. And the OER what? is an officer evaluation oh, report. For yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. All of your yeah. officer evaluation reports, your report cards, at the, the minimum could be three months, but you get one at least every 12 months, if, if, I, if I remember correctly. Um, and, so, um, and so there have been officers who found out later on when you talk to your branch assignment officer in my cohort, my peers, and they were told, well, you know, this is going to stand out when we were second lieutenants or captains and told, well, you know, you're the young officer and, you know, I, I can only give so many slots. And, you know, I don't know the answer to that. And then on the other side, there are, and Powell says he heard this, there are some uh, officers who are not African-American who will 
say that, well, you only got, you know, promoted or selected because you were African-American. And we got to figure that out, HR. And I think yeah. I've been retired for 12 years. I think you've only been retired for four years. So you may know better, but I think they took out the, the, the image. It's there. That's right. And now, yeah. now there's a move to maybe bring it back. I mean, we, maybe we should talk about this now. I mean, I, you know, I mean, the story that we're telling is a story not of linear progress, right, toward equality of opportunity for black, uh, you know, servicemen and women, uh, officers, uh, all, all in, in the military. Uh, but it's not one without progress, right? And it's progress, I think, that that, that we're, we're, many people should get credit for it, especially uh, those black uh, servicemen and women and officers and others who persevered uh, through through difficulties uh, to to build an institution that I believe Kurowski and I, and and you're you know I'd love to hear your thoughts on this it, who, that adheres to a culture that is fundamentally intolerant now of racism, bigotry, sexism, you know other forms of of, of prejudice or maltreatment of, of of other team members. Now that doesn't say that doesn't mean the military is perfect. But right. what I'm concerned about today is there are some people who think, hey, well, to get to that utopian level, right, of complete equality of opportunity, what we need is, and this is you know, some of the various critical theories, postmodernist theories say, well, what you need is you need more racism right, <laughs> to correct, you know, previous yeah. ills or, mm -hmm. you know, this idea that you should evaluate people not on what they bring to the team. And, you know, we as soldiers, what do we evaluate people by? Hey your toughness, your courage, your sense of honor, your empathy, and your willingness to sacrifice for one another, regardless of what the heck your skin color is, you know? So, right. so I, I do get concerned about how some of these, you know, philosophies that have, you know, really gotten a lot of traction, especially in academia, mm -hmm. uh, I, I just think they would be so destructive, you know, if they were foisted on our military by maybe, you know, well-meaning mm -hmm. uh, civilian political leaders, but who don't understand you know, the, the real sources of, of combat effectiveness and, and the cohesion in units that underpins it. So no, I, I'd no, love ahead. to hear your view, your views on this. And if you're concerned at all, or. Yeah. You know, I, I should have been, you know, there, there are about five or six questions in there. A great point, <laughs> but I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to take the first one, you know, and just raise my hand, me, you know, um, I am a retired Colonel with a PhD because I served in the military. You know, I think I could have done something in civilian life and been successful, but um, probably like you, I was that young lieutenant, first lieutenant, still stationed in Germany when I got the letter that said, because of your academic background and your success in the military thus far, you are a candidate to go teach at West Point. But then it had all these requirements, you know, as a lieutenant, your battery commander is God. So one of them, you have to have a successful battery command, pass a GRE, get into an accredited school and X, Y, and Z. But that's how I went to school to be a military historian. And then I had a major, major professor who didn't look like me. My major professor was a white man. And he introduced me to ABD. He said, you know, you know I think while you're here, um, you know, you should take as many classes as you can while you're a resident. And so I say that to say this, um, what concerns me is uh, some of this is actually turning off um, perhaps some young African-American men and women who would go into the military and the military will could have the opportunity to make your life better. So that's the other side of the story you know, there, there is biases that, 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 that exist, but also the military gives you an opportunity. If right. you are a person that goes forward and does your job to the same standard of your peers. So I will say this, and, you know, I told you at the beginning, um, you know, I, I, I'm a reticent person of telling my personal story, HR. You know, so I'm going to tell. A piece I, of I want you to tell our, our viewers how you got your first <laughs> name, because I mean, it's re it's re it's relevant to this, right? It's relevant. I'm, I'm going to tell the story. I'm going to tell just a piece of it. You know, I'm a retired colonel with 25 years. Do you ever question why I didn't go to 30? You know, I'm not asking you. That's a rhetorical question. So for our viewers, most people who make 06, 
your retirement is 30 years. You can stay to 30 years. Well, um, when it came time for, you know, you put your box for brigade command, I'm an air defender, so we have, uh, we only have three combat brigades. And, you know, there are different brigades. You can become a support commander, a garrison commander. I only checked the box for brigade combat. And then I got the call from the brand. Well, you know, you know, there are about 25 of you guys, you're shooting yourself in the foot if you want to stay in the military. Uh, it's worse to that effect, you know, I'm doing a little bit of paraphrasing. And I said, well, hey, you know, I, you know, if I'm you knew what you this, wanted to do, you knew what you wanted I, to I do. I said, because I was going to retire at 20, but I had a great mentor uh, who, again, you know, I have great black mentors and great white mentors. And I, you know, I hate to say white and black, but it was my boss who was a white guy when I put my papers in and I told him I was going to retire at 20. And he brought me into his office several times and talked to me, talked to me. <laughs> and, and I stayed in. He said, you know, look at your record. You're going to do X, Y, and Z. You're going to come out on this list and that list. And that's not what I was serving for. But he just said, you know, we need your talent. And not to say that, you know, greatest thing since sliced bread. So I stayed in and I did get picked up for the war college and get promoted. Uh, but then when I was told that, I said, well, hey, you know, uh, I do want to do something else with my life. So that's why I got out when I hit my three year mark and it was okay, it was okay. But the army has allowed me to have an afterlife. And a part of your question, there was a lot there, is I do fear that some of the biases that people know do exist among some people are keeping some people from joining our force who, if they join the military, you know, could go on to do bigger and better things in life. And we're not asking everyone to stay in 20, 25 years and 30 years, just stay in three years. I know a lot of young folks, uh, you know, who have stayed in for three years or six years and they're using that military background, the GI Bill to go on to do greater things. But there is some uh, inequalities and I found out and I, you know, and it was too late for me to realize that I didn't know as a second lieutenant or as a captain, I didn't know in my first OER, I should have advocated. I didn't have you know, one to kind of tell me that. And, you know, um, that's why, you know, I, that's why I'm not a 30 year colonel. I I wanted, I, 25 is pretty good. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I wanted, good. I, if I was going to command a brigade, I wanted to have one of those uh, combat arms brigades. I didn't mm -hmm. check the garrison. I didn't check any of those other boxes. And I kind of knew it because my, my peers were great. You were great men, you know, and women by that point. And I will say, you know, when I commanded the Pac-3 Patriot Missile Battalion, I had the largest contingent of women. My Pac-3 Patriot Missile Battalion was 22% women. Yeah. You know, so I, you know, to shout out to, you know, our men and women are a part of our national security. So just to bring this forward to the end, you know, the audacity, we say, of China to fly a balloon over our country. So let me close this with the national security piece, you know, um, because and I think you write about some of this in your book about how they have infiltrated our social media and everything, you know, China, and I hate to say this. China, Russia, North Korea, and some of those other adversaries, they're looking at us, HR. Yeah. And if we can implode ourselves and erode our own combat power, then more for them. And that's why we as Americans got to figure it out, not only in the military, you know, I can tell you stories as a civilian, but it's, you know, that's not important. What's important is we got to figure out how to be Americans. You know, um, I, I can trace my American heritage back to about the Civil War, but not much before that, because there's a reason why African Americans can't do that. But I can trace it back that far. You know, I, I'm like a fifth, sixth, seventh, gen I don't know, generation American. And so are a lot of other African Americans. You read H. Min Minton Francis' story, probably in, the, uh, in my Black uh, officer book. He is that fifth or sixth African-American to graduate from West Point, who was a fifth generation American. His grandfather was free before the Civil War, 
had one of the most popular hotels in uh, Washington, D.C. And when he goes to West Point in, in um, 1941, it was, uh, you know, he's talking about all of the treatment that was being given to him by some of the white cadets. And I say some because he also talked about the bright and great Americans who, when he was a senior, you know, kind of secretly took him under his wings. But some of those freshmen, when he came in as a freshman who had been first generation Americans and they were asking him, you know, why does the N word wants to come to America? And I interviewed him. If you look in the back of my book, I interviewed 15 of these people. So I was a young captain HR yeah. and I was interviewing these men and women who were in their seventies and eighties. I donated all of that. It's on camera too. I donated all of those to the Smithsonian. So people, I feel bad. I didn't have control over them for three years. And someone asked a friend of ours, I won't say the name here, asked me for that because my book came out and I didn't have control. I could never send it. But now they have um, fully brought it in because we were trying to get the museum open. But we got to figure it out, HR, because our national security breaks down when soldiers of all races, of all genders, don't trust their leaders or their soldiers on their left and right. And us as leaders, cohesion on the battlefield will break down. And that's why it's important to know that African-Americans have always been there for two reasons. It's important for the African-American young man and woman to know that his and her ancestors contributed to this great America. And it's also important for white Americans to know that although there were ills, there were African-American, uh, white Americans that supported them along the way. Otherwise, you know, African-Americans couldn't pass the 13th, 14th and 15th Amendment. They didn't have the power. They didn't have the yeah, power. Right, they were just right. and so it's well, important for them to know we got to work together. We got to work together. And you know what? What I just want to have a message for any young viewers and listeners. I mean, joining the military has tremendous rewards associated with Absolutely. it, right? And, it, and it's being it's friendships like ours, right? I mean, yes. you know, I mean, we're bound together by a sense of common purpose and commitment to our nation and to one another, right? Regardless of identity category you know and and uh you know you may you're making me think about my you know first real mentor in the military is my first battalion commander billy j mcgowan you know mm -hmm. and he happened to be a black officer but mm -hmm. you know I, it didn't matter to either one of us you know and, and 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 uh and you know he was kind enough to be at my retirement ceremony after <laughs> you know, after 34 years in, in the military and we've remained connected and and so i just think that you know there's this misperception that could discourage you know, people of all different backgrounds to, to join our military, but our military, I would just say our military is not radical. Our military is not, you know, woke, whatever the heck that means. Our, our military is, <laughs> is, is, is committed to defending our nation and, yeah. and, and they're committed to one another, you know? And, and so I, I hope that, you know, what, what is largely infected academia does not, you know, does not infect our military and hopefully our discussion uh, mm -hmm. will contribute to that. And, you know, I just want to say, you know, Professor, Dr. Colonel <laughs> Salter, you know, hey, you are still serving because what you're, you are doing for our country is immensely important. And I think the work that you've done in museums and through your scholarship, through your teaching is strengthening the fabric of our, of our society, helping us bring us together, at, mm -hmm. respectful of our different backgrounds and experiences and identities and cultures, but recognizing you know, what we do have in common uh, as Americans and, and in our uh, through our historical experience. So, hey, on, on behalf of the Hoover Institution, I can't I can't thank you enough. I want to give you the last word before we wrap up. But this has been just a tremendous discussion. Uh, I've enjoyed it so much and I can't thank you enough. Well, I think the last word, HR, is just thank you for having me on your show and for uh, convincing me that, yeah, African-American history is a part of battlegrounds because I think most people know your show is mostly about international battlegrounds, international politics and national security as it relates with foreign policy. And uh, I do think that as I was thinking about this program and when I got an invitation, I was like, okay, let me think about this. Uh, there is a national security implication and I already knew that. And I will tell you that you drew a lot out of me, a lot, I said a lot here that I have never said um, in, on a public forum on your show because I am an American. I did serve our country. 
And I think we have to come together. Absolutely. And hey, but we'll save it for our next conversation about, about your first name. But you know what? I, I think yeah. let's just do a bonus round for our viewers who are still with us. Tell us that story, just because I think it, it's a, a little bit of a metaphor, right? For, yeah. Yeah. you know, and uh, for, you know, for what we've been talking about. Yeah, so, you know, uh, as I said, and maybe you showed it in the intro, the picture of my father. My father is a retired command sergeant major, retired four-star command sergeant major. He was the command sergeant major of CENTCOM. So for people who are saying, Sergeant Major Salter, oh, that's, yeah, he has a son. That's his son. <laughs> um, and so my father's name is Tony. Uh, he has several cousins named Tony. He had a few uncles named Tony. My mother sister's son was named Tony and she had a few cousins named Tony and my father wanted another Tony. And my mother said, no more Tonys. And so my father had a buddy in basic training. And so he, I guess he figured out, okay, I need a different name then. I can't name my son Tony. And so he named me. And so here's an African-American man who was drafted in the military and went to basic and AIT. And so my name comes from my father's uh, recollection of a uh, soldier he went to AIT and or basic with. I never got to meet the soldier. And it was really born out of my mother wanted no more Tonys. <laughs> and it's been cool to be a military brat and then to go into the military and have that name. And so it's, it's a Russian Jewish name when I tell people uh, I'm not Russian Jewish, I'm African American. <laughs> <laughs> I can't think of anybody better uh, to have had this discussion with. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you, sir. Take care. Battlegrounds is a production of the Hoover Institution, where we advance ideas that define a free society. For more information about our work, to hear more of our podcasts, or view our video content, please visit hoover.org.